Okay. Joel, can you hear us? I can. Awesome. So uh, hopefully you were paying attention to what Tony was saying, uh, which reminded me of you. I wanted to pick it up, uh, pick up the discussion with you, Joel. You're talking about this changing role of a geospatial professional. And when I look at the work that you've done and you touched on something near and dear to my heart towards the end of your presentation, which is about user-centric people-focused design. And it's very interesting because you're not a GIS professional uh, by training. And on the box, on the top right of my box here, we have Jamie Lambert, your colleague from Down Under, who is coming from it from another perspective. So I'm curious, based on what you heard from Tony and from the rest of the presenters, do you have any new insights perhaps that you can share? Yeah, yes, I, I think, um, you know, to, what Tony said, and even, you know, I saw what, what Julia was talking about. Um, you know, I think there is a need to create tools that non-GIS professionals can interact with. And I think that creating a sound, sandbox environment is one way, right, of creating a safe place for people to explore without uh, fear of kind of exploding the whole system. Um, I think that, um, you know, we all love interacting with people, showing them a map and bringing in different data sets to draw a conclusion, seeing their eyes light, you know, get wide and they get very excited. Um, I think that's kind of the joy of GIS, right, is that it's easy to, to do that. And I think we can't lose sight of that because there's, um, there's a whole, you know, like I said, in our, in our team within EMPS, the vast majority are not GIS experts. And I want to make sure that I do my part, just like I'm sure everybody else on the panel feels the same way, to, to bring them along, right? To, to let them learn um, in, a, in an environment where they can, but also respect the expertise that they have. Because without respect for the expertise that they've gathered over their careers, our tools aren't going to be as powerful as they can be. Yeah, well, very well said. On that note, uh, Jamie, I made a note from your presentation earlier uh, about the flowchart that you showed early on, uh, which kind of talks about the, the process and how you went about coming up with this process. And picking up off of Joel, um, you work with, you, you're at that intersection point dealing with business, like a Joel, for instance. What is, what is your kind of perspective on, uh, on what Joel mentioned and how do you see that business and technology intersecting Especially, I'm sure this project that you did, it didn't happen overnight. You had to go through multiple iterations with different opinions and perceptions and all of that. So can you share uh, some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's always a lot of opinions. Um, but, but I think, um, you know, one of the common themes that we've seen today is user-centric and also, you know, where GIS fits in an organization. And... The same, uh, you know, as Tony mentioned, it's, it's very similar to us at ExxonMobil, where GIS, uh, GIS is historically sort of within the geoscience group. And there's a lot of opportunity outside of that, that, you know, we're, 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 I think we're starting to get after. And, you know, Joel's been doing a bit of work on that as well, and just sort of uh, engaging that community. And it's really about, you know, having those simple workflows and those um you know focused focused apps that you can start engaging non-gis practitioners and they need to be able to self-serve and i think the more the more of that that you can accommodate then the more that message is getting out to other parts of the business and um it, you know for this for this little project that we did um we didn't have much trouble convincing management that this was the right approach. And I think, you know, one of the big reasons for, for that is that a lot of the management in the, in the decommissioning area, I've worked with them in the past in other roles, you know, in other teams that they've been on. And we've done some, uh, you know, field data collection, tra digital transformation, that sort of thing. So there's a history of, while they don't necessarily understand the details of GIS, um, they've got a history of understanding the value of GIS. And so the more you can get that message out across the business and across different parts of the business and across different users and, uh, and sort of uh, make people aware that they can engage with this data in a different way without having to have that vertical skill, 
or that vertical knowledge. So, you know, the, the, really the web and the mobile GIS platform help with that and help get that message out there and help getting people in touch with the data and, and sort of playing with the data. And, you know, historically, um, and, and for, for sort of the data we're looking at for the, this decommissioning project, it's table-based data. We get a lot of PDF reports. And it's a very different way of looking at the data. And, and often um, you, you're sort of only looking at a piece of the data. You're not able to integrate it into a broader, bigger picture. So by, so by making this transition and getting people more comfortable in this space and also their understanding of what can be achieved, then you're really starting to engage more people and get that momentum and sort of, you know, break that um, uh, historical boundary of GIS being in a certain part of the business, which is, you know, generally sort of more the upstream piece of it. And there's so much opportunity outside of the upstream and, 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 and most, and, you know, really the work that I do is all, is all focused on those other pieces of the business and engaging engineers a lot. So I, I hope that helped. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, which is a good segue to a question I had for Julia. Julia, your work uh, with the turnaround planning, it's, it's going to have an impact over a large swath of people. Um, because it, as Jamie just mentioned, big picture, that's what you're trying to deliver uh, through that. So if you haven't already started, I'm sure you will be at a point where you are interacting with a lot of people and how they want their solutions and apps configured and things of that nature. Can you can you speak to how you're addressing that, how you're going about that process at this point? I think Julia's on mute. Here, it's now working. Yep, we Perfect. can hear you fine. All right. <laughs> Well, we at OMV, we are separated in upstream and downstream, and upstream is using a GIS for, I think, more than 10 years already. And by us and downstream, it's quite new. So we only started in 2019. So it's getting more and more people get to know our GIS through presentations and key users uh, trainings. But it's a little bit difficult now because we don't have that much data in it. We just add the basic. And it's hard to tell people to do something with the GIS because they always want to find their things, their equipment, also the smallest parts and vessels and valves. So we are now focusing on the turnaround team because they are able to use it also without that many information in it. They only need the editing layer and um, defined user management. And now also the other planning groups um, found out that we have the GIS. <laughs> and so we have already um, parallel project plannings into the GIS. And I'm trying with more and more presentations within the OMV, we're finding new key users to get to know the, the um, business areas that may use the GIS way better because I don't have a real refinery background. So everything, not only GIS is new for the people at the refinery, but also the refinery business is new for me. So we mm -hmm. are, but I think we're in a good way through a lot of presentations and trainings to get more information and more people into the GIS. I think an interesting point you mentioned was about upstream doing GIS for more than 10 years and uh, and downstream kind of just getting started. Um, in my mind, I tend to think about patterns of use when it comes to GIS. You know, at the end of the day, it's about data and people needing to do something with the data. So given OMV's history in the upstream, do you kind of see any similar patterns and trends that you can perhaps replicate or leverage uh, in the downstream space? Not really, because the upstream is mainly focused on analysis. So where can they get new oil and gas? And we at downstream, we really have a 2D and 3D data that we want to visualize. We mm -hmm. want to find things in it instead of um, checking for a plan in two or three softwares, but just knowing the name, so you need to know the name, we can go into the GIS, say, okay, I have the item tag number, or I know where it is located in the refinery, and then have the visualization, then I can find the things and locate it. And in upstream, gotcha. they mainly do analysis. So it's where we can work together is maybe in the 3D part, because also upstream, 
is going into this 3D direction. And also we want to go there and visualize all of our 3D models in the GIS. So with a 3D viewer data converter, those are things that we can work together. Okay. Um, one, the one question on, the, on your work, Julia, was about real time. Is there, um, there, I'm sure there are sensors of all kinds across the refinery. Um, is there plans on bringing that into this digital twin? How are you kind of laying the path for that going forward? Yeah, of course. Also in the, in the turnaround planning, so we now have the two and a half D, then you want to have the three D turnaround planning and then the anti 40 planning so that we really can visualize where's a container, when is it there, how does the crane move when they are coming, um, vehicles in the refinery, where are they located, if we have external partners, can we ensure where they are and that they stay in their area and so on. The first step is now with the subhana that we have with the e-work permits so that they receive our visualizations, our ge geometry out of the GIS into their visualization in the subhana environment. And the next step, we are going to get their data into the GIS. And then the next step in the future, we also want to make interfaces to these refinery apps like Comos, Mars, Esma Explorer, where, as you said, we have a lot of sensors in the refinery and they're also collect already collecting data. So okay. it would be a shame if we don't use it in the GIS to visualize it. <laughs> yeah. Joel, uh, in your work, you mentioned refineries as well as one of the lines of business. As Julia is talking about her work, I'm kind of thinking, are there any dots? At least I'm seeing some dots that are connecting between perhaps your domain and the, and the operational side of refineries. I don't know if you see it the same way. Absolutely. There are, um, of real estate touches all, you know, all business lines because we all own um, or somewhat manage real estate in our footprint. And so there's a lot of um, interconnectivity between how we use our real estate or maybe how even our customers use real estate that we can leverage, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing here and what we're talking about to, to take advantage of. I know, um, you know, pulling together um, demographic data, pulling together, you know, traffic counts, all of the business analyst tools um, that, that Esri kind of has, has compiled, compiled. Is a, is a great way that we can um, support not only our refineries or our, our fuels and lubes business, but also their customers, right? And, and making sure that w you know, we are helping them also be successful. Great. Um, thanks, Joel. I've, I do want to switch over to a couple of user questions um, that are popping up on my screen here. Uh, Tony, this one's for you. Are you at a stage that demographics and spatial analytics are helping to select new retail locations as you grow? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in in our, um, it's, it's very easy for me to talk about retail and, and bundle everything together, but um, absolutely in our, you know, typical downstream retail business in the same way as what Exxon or BP or um, any other uh, energy provider would have. We absolutely use all of those things to uh, identify new locations. Um, and, and you talked at the beginning some statistics about growing our retail footprint to 55,000 sites around the world. We absolutely do that um, by utilizing uh, ESRI tools, um, spatial data analytics, um, and we utilize you know, a huge diversity of data sets uh, demographic, um, you know, movement of of commercial and domestic um, vehicles, um, footprint, all that kind of stuff. And I don't think we do anything different to maybe what everybody else in, in this community does. Um, pretty standard stuff, but extremely powerful and, and extremely insightful in terms of helping us to make the right decisions about where we put a retail site. And, and I think that will mature and grow as we start to move towards electric vehicles and, and the change in behavior that will drive for, you know, people will need to, to pause whilst their vehicle is charged. They'll need to consume maybe a wider set of services and interact in a different way. So in many ways that will drive for different considerations from the data and different utilizations of the systems and tools. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, 
uh, along those lines, I have one more for you, which is actually I had this question, but I forgot to ask you earlier. How are you leveraging real-time consumer data in your efforts uh, in supply chain or perhaps in marketing efforts? We discussed about the concept of human movement data and customer profiling, but this question is more specific about how are you actually utilizing, if, if at all, right now? Uh, to a degree, yeah. And again, it's market dependent based on what you can do and what you can't do. Um, but if you can consider that we have um, part of our mobile technology infrastructure embedded in some of the vehicles that um, some of the, the vehicle manufacturing industry produce. So for instance, Land Rover, um, you know, we have um, some uh, app uh, technology uh, within their dashboard that allows us to do um, or facilitate the journey management that allows us to facilitate prepayment. So if effectively you can pull up at a retail site, you can be um, in receipt of fuel without actually leaving the car and also actually ha actually having to make a transaction in the retail site because it's all done via the vehicle using APIs. Um, and that's absolutely driven by the vehicle transmitting information to our technology about um, fuel consumption, about the remaining fuel, about the proximity and the location of the next Shell retail site, about information on the forecourt about how busy that retail site is um, and the av availability of pumps, which then makes, which allows for individuals to make decisions about, should I fill up at the next retail site or should I wait for another 20 miles down the road where there's, where there's more availability and I'll be able to get in and out quicker. So we're, we're in that space. It's very much market driven. Um, yeah, it's, it's a whole new world. It's right on the very edge of, of downstream, right on the very edge of retail, right on the very yeah. edge of data. Interesting stuff. Uh, by the way, if you guys have any questions for each other, please feel free to, it doesn't have to uh, be me asking the questions. So Joel, uh, Jamie and Julia, please go ahead. I'll just look up a couple of quick questions here. Uh, we have one for Julia. Uh, have you considered field apps in the refinery leveraging GIS and services you have built? Yeah, we're not using it now, but we plan it for our inspectors that go outside in the refinery for checking equipment. So mm. if they have their safety walks out there to see a problem, they can use the field app, they can make a photograph, write a comment, a text, and then it pops up in the GIS. So we do plan to okay. use that, of course, yeah. Very cool. Um, related to that, uh, have you had the chance to capture before, after time and effort metrics for the new Taranaran workflows, workflow tools? Mm -hmm. We did okay. it and we have benefit. <laughs> nice. So. Uh, yeah, Joel, uh, sorry, go sorry. ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, this planning ahead. phase, it's about two years, as mentioned in the presentation. And right. it's way easier for them now that they plan it in one single source system. Everyone can see it, even if you're not in the workshop where they plan it, you can check it afterwards. And everyone is up to date the whole time. So it's okay. really improving the workflow. Okay. Uh, Joel, um, Question for you, are you building your own story maps, dashboards, business analyst workflows, or via your GIS team? That's an interesting one. Um, so we're, we're using the templates and building our own and creating our own. Um, but our GIS team obviously can, can support us as well. Um, but um, most of the, the story maps that we're using, it's our, our team is building it themselves. OK. Uh, another one related to that is you mentioned um, people-oriented design. And the question is, has that really shortened uh, the design, build, and delivery timeframes for your products and services within ExxonMobil? Absolutely, and in some instances, right, we, we are able to kind of deliver what we um, either have learned that our, our, our users need. Um, and so, you know, we kind of bypass all of the uh, world of the possible, right? That, that a lot of times you, you get involved with trying to put out the absolute best product or tool and you end up spending a year, right? Um, 
developing this this great tool that um, really could have been released at version one and answer one question and get usage and then develop as you go. And so our uh, we, we kind of take that lean approach to, to designing and, and implementing our, our maps and dashboards. And if we can solve one real problem, if we can save time in one real solution, we go ahead with it, right? And then we tweak it as we go. And um, that's, that's not necessarily always kind of the a tried and true IT um, approach, but it, it's worked for us really well. Okay. Well, that reminded me of uh, uh, Jamie. Uh, you mentioned uh, agile project development or management. So you're both our colleagues at ExxonMobil. Does that ring a bell? Does that resonate with you in terms of how you approach catering to your customers within within Australia? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know you can run into a lot of problems if you try and deliver the ultimate, you know, the hundred percent solution. Um, and 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 a big part of that is how long is that going to take? So by the time you have that ready, I think the customer's already moved on. You know, they've found another solution or another way. So you've got to you've you've got to be fairly quick. And the other piece of that is that you you, you know it's it's how much you understand of what their needs are and how well they communicate those needs. So I've worked on projects where. You know, we've, we'll just get something out there, and also with the Esri apps, you can you can be having a you know a Zoom meeting with someone, and they can be talking about your dashboard and say, "Oh, it's really great, but I'd like to see this or that." And while you're having that conversation, you can make some of those updates, and that's quite impressive. And I think that engagement helps with uptake when you know when the customer um, uh, can see that you can develop dynamically, that's a real win instead of waiting three months or something for, for an update to come. You know, they're just, whenever there's something that comes in, you do the update and push it out. And even in the if people are in the field, we've had people in the field call me up and say, hey, uh, I'm trying to do this and I'm not able to. And often it's just a simple fix. So you can update the survey, push the survey, they can download the update and then off they go with no real interruption, no real downtime. So there's a lot of value in getting getting whatever that product is out early and into the user's hands and letting them come back with the feedback because there's always going to be something that you've that you've missed. And, and, and that could be um, could just be a case of whoever your customer is doesn't know how to communicate that need or doesn't understand they have that need yet until they go through that process. So I think that agile what development, that, that's it exactly. And they don't understand <clears throat> the capabilities of the technology. So you, you've got to give them something to play with and they've got to use it. And then you can, you can, you know, make those updates as they come in. And, and that way they're not waiting for a tool. Yeah. Yeah. T Tony, I want to pick up on that point back to you because I'm sure in your career, you've done your fair share of what we're talking about here, but now you're an executive and you have a large organization that you oversee. And I also heard you say that you empathize much more with the geospatial community just based on your background. How do you see it at Shell? How do you have any kind of process methodology uh, things that are in place um, to help advance and fuel innovation? Yeah, I'm just listening to to the conversation and just reflecting a little bit on how difficult it can be to satisfy um, the user community's needs, which are often immediate. You know, we want a development now. We want um, some kind of app enhancement or you know configuration done to an existing site or whatever. And, there's always an immediacy of of requirement. You know, everybody wants it yesterday. Um, and being able to manage that in a large organization um, that is absolutely digital. I mean, we are uh, an energy retailer, but principally we are a digital organization. Everything that we do faces off to the customer um, in, in some kind of digital uh, manner. Um, and, and to support that, basically a third of the company organization is, is technology. Um, 
and and for me that's about uh, 400 people which are pred predominantly developers uh, and analysts um but that doesn't necessarily satisfy the demand i, I can't necessarily get things quick to market yeah. so one of the initiatives that we're pioneering in shell is is something called diy um which is enabling our user communities to be empowered to do a degree of coding and configuration and development themselves within certain applications and systems within the parameters of being safe and controlled yep. and sustainable um so if you can consider that you know we we try and encourage our non-tech users to learn python and and to develop the skills where they can actually go and just create things for themselves and actually relieve some of the pressure in the backlog of, you know, I need this development and you might be 100 in the list. And, <clears throat> and we're finding that that is an extremely appreciated approach. It's a bit innovative and you could argue it's a bit risky, but um, within the right constraints and the right parameters, we, we, see, we see value being realised. And, and I think that's a good example of maybe again where we could encourage our user communities in a geospatial sense to partner with some of our geospatial professionals and just migrate or or transpose some of that knowledge to to broaden the awareness but also enable others to be able to do things for themselves fantastic uh, i think that's a that's a really really good insight and uh, we are right at time uh with that last question there i greatly appreciate you guys coming in and especially for the audience may not realize but uh jamie is um is it what 6 a.m jamie your time at this point he started off at like four o'clock four a.m yeah, so seven seven now so i really appreciate <laughs> <laughs> you already got your two hours in anyway so uh thank you so much for coming in julia uh fantastic presentation and great insights joel Thanks as always, and, and Tony. Um, it's been an interesting experience for me personally over the last couple of weeks as we've been preparing for this session. And I know I started the session by talking about a paradox in downstream and how do we define uh, downstream better. Just based on this experience, I think I can tell you that I've gotten a lot more clarity on thinking about things. And I really hope the audience that's watching this today, uh, they feel the same way and they got a lot out of it. Once again, thank you all very so very much. We really appreciate your time and please enjoy Thank the you. rest of the conference. Thank Brilliant. you. So Thank you. Best of luck, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye.